Welcome to the fascinating world of ants. From a human perspective, we don't initially notice much about ant reproduction. So today, we'll go on a journey through the reproduction secrets of one of the most incredible animals on Earth. Every journey needs a beginning. Let's start by exploring what aspects of ant reproduction are actually visible to us humans. For example, once or twice a year, something extraordinary happens. Whenever a hemisphere enters its warm season, be it in the tropical regions or the colder climates of the Earth, hundreds of ants take flight simultaneously. It could be thousands for some species. All of these ants are from the same species, but they are from different anthills. For obvious reasons, most ants can't reproduce forever within the same colony. Those flights allow ants to mate with other colony members and to keep mixing genetic material. Many scientists wonder how ants know across different colonies when it's time to fly. Is it happening at the same time because colonies have a way of communication or is it due to an outside event? It's often a particular event which triggers the race to reproduction. For instance, heavy rain in arid areas softens the soil to help the new queen dig the hole they would hide in. Some ant species have developed another method. Males fly first. Doing so, they spread a pheromone in the air that even we can smell, and the ant princesses join them in the air. Ants are most vulnerable when they are isolated. During the mating event, and after when the young queen searches for a suitable place to start a new nest, the casualty rate is high. Nobody's there yet to protect the young and tired queen when birds, lizards and other predators are happy to feast on them. For such reasons, some rare ant species as Mycoceparus smithii reproduce using cloning. Basically, there are no males at all, but this kind of reproduction method is rare. When a queen starts to settle a nest, she stays hidden and sheds her now unnecessary wings by tearing them off with her legs and mandibles. She also sometimes eats them. Precious calories for a queen without her workers, trying to survive her first steps outside her old colony. In the first days, the queen herself is taking care of the ants. She lays eggs to feed the first workers, too weak to forage. In the matter of survival, the end justifies the means. These first ants are called nanetics or minims. Eventually, the colony grows and workers start to take care of all tasks, except laying eggs. This is Her Majesty's royal duty, for the rest of her life. All ant species have different schedules for each phase. Let's start with an overview of the common features. An ant stays between 7 and 14 days in an egg. The time variation depends on the species, of course, but also on the temperature and humidity levels. These eggs are white with a gelatinous texture. Unlike bird eggs, ant eggs are not protected with a strong calcium shield. They are soft and relatively vulnerable. They depend on the collective to survive. Larvae are the next stage. A larva is yellowish, pale and transparent. It moves and looks like a maggot. A larva has to shed its skin as it grows, a bit like snakes do. Adult ants are not able to eat solid food, but larvae don't share these limitations. They can eat insects directly from the source. You could observe some ant species bringing whole insects or parts of them inside the anthill. This food is often taken directly to the nursery. There are even some ant species that do it the other way around and carry their larvae to their food source. A larva needs between one and two weeks to reach the next stage. Pupa stage is the last step before becoming a full adult ant. Ants at this stage still need workers to be fed. Pupae are enveloped in a white or brownish cocoon. Just by looking at it, you can see the ant taking shape. Legs and antennas are the most distinguishable features here. But for other species, pupae look like a solid bigger egg, as they are shielded in a cocoon. According to the species, a pupa needs 9 days to 1 month to become a fully grown ant. A young ant is lighter than the other workers. Her body is slightly transparent and becomes darker as she gets older. Because of a lack of food diversity, the first generations of workers are often smaller and thinner than the following ones. Most of the ants are divided in two main categories, males and females. In the kingdom of ants, the usefulness of males is limited to reproduction. 
Their lives are short and they don't participate in the collective work. It's fair to say that reproduction really is the sole reason for their existence. Females, for their part, are divided into queens and workers. In nature, before becoming the mother of a future colony, a princess is not much more productive than the males. But not out of laziness. Like males, she's only gathering her strength. She stays in dark corridors, well fed and taken care of, for now. The active queen, on the other hand, is busy all her life, laying eggs. All the other females are workers. They are divided in subcategories. Soldiers, nurses, explorers, cleaners, farmers and more. There are still a lot of mysteries concerning ants. But scientists observe that the food diet and the quantity of hormones given to larvae would change the cast of workers. More food and hormones would create bigger ants, called the majors. A wrong assumption is to think that major ants are older because they are bigger. They are bigger since birth in order to defend the colony or attack enemies, as well as occasionally helping workers with heavy loads or foraging. We suspect that environmental conditions and deliberate actions of the ant nurses would also modify the cast of an ant about to be born. When workers have two different sizes, the species is called dimorphic. If it has more than two sizes, it's a polymorphic species. All other species are monomorphic. But one thing is clear, whether the species are mono, di or polymorphic, all workers have different roles within the colony and ants don't keep the same job their whole life. A social organization where a reproductive caste is split from the workers is called a eusociality. Such a society is fully dedicated to the protection of the queen and the brood. It is found in the Hymenoptera order, including ants, bees and wasps. But you would also find this organization among crustaceans and, more surprisingly, some types of rat. You might be curious now about how a queen actively switches between creating females and males, a foreign concept to us humans. Remember, the queen can keep functional spermatozoids all her life. She also has control over the egg fertilization. Not fertilizing an egg would produce a male. This process is called parthenogenesis. It is a method of controlled reproduction that differs from mammals. You could say a male ant has no father, but only a mother. Males produce haploid spermatozoids. That means they have only one set of chromosomes. Queens produce also haploid eggs, but when she chooses to fertilize them, the eggs have then two sets of chromosomes and will give birth to a diploid individual, a female. If the egg is not fertilized, the queen has given birth to a haploid individual, a male. You may have already heard that workers are asexual castes, but that's not entirely accurate. Of course, in some species such as the genus of the Fidol ants, sterile workers exist. These are exceptions though. From a genetic perspective, all workers are females. Surprisingly, in most species, workers have the ability to lay eggs just like the queen. So why is the nest not overflowing from all the potential eggs the workers could produce? Here's why. The queen produces a hormone to prevent the other females from developing ovaries. Another hypothesis is that the larvae also broadcast the same hormone. That would explain why the workers produce eggs when they are far from the nest. You probably already guessed that workers are not fertilized by any male, meaning they would only produce unfertilized eggs. So workers are only able to produce males. While males are essential for spreading the species, they don't really help with the everyday tasks, like workers do. It's the reason why a colony with only one queen often dies shortly after its sovereign meets their maker. Another problem caused by workers laying eggs is the fact these individuals become less productive. In order to prevent the situation, some ant species enlist workers to control other workers. The stress induced by these policing actions can lead workers to suppress their reproductive abilities. This police force can eventually eat the eggs if the offending ant does not stay in line. In the ant kingdom, reproduction should not get out of hand. The reproduction of ants reflects their impressive eusocial organization that leads to their many great achievements. But even so, there are still many secrets for scientists to discover in the anthem.